Well, hello, hello, and... Oh, now it comes in. <laughs> hello, hello, <coughs> and welcome back. Off to a terrible start here. For those of you that are actually watching live, I have comments open on YouTube. So I will check and see if you have anything to say there. And for those of you that are not actually watching live, check the link in the description. There may be an edited version of this in the Beyond Code Bootcamp playlist. Uh, we are going to be talking about hashes. This is kind of a continuation of the Git conversation. So I've got the chat open. I will go ahead and get us started. Well, hello, hello, and welcome back. Tonight, we're going to be talking about hashes. And when I say hashes, what I mean, I'm referring to the kind of hashes that we have with Git. So let me go into one of our projects here. Uh, let's see, beyond code, is it demo? I think that is the right place. Yeah, I'm going to pick the example project from this morning. Okay, if I do a git log, you can see that there are these commit hashes. These are being represented as hexadecimal, which is an encoding. I actually need to talk about two things. I need to talk about ha uh, encodings first, and then I need to talk about hashes. Because hashes can be represented in many different encodings and mean the same thing. Anyway, so you see these both. They're kind of long, but they're actually not that long, all things considered. What they are is an identifier of all of the contents in all of the files in the directory as well as metadata. So let me back out of this. Oh no, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> it's the Rona. Okay. So let's, two things that we need to talk about. One is encoding. Every piece of data is encoded. Otherwise it's not data, it's noise. And Oh, I didn't share my screen. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, here we are. So if I have the letter A, that is encoded as ASCII. That's why it's presenting as the letter A. If I were to do two, I think it's code point. No, code point of, let's see, what do we get here? If we're just looking at A, var A equals ABC, A dot, there we go. Give me two lowercase, two uppercase, Mm, to, to, is it, maybe it's string dot from char code. I could have sworn it should be to char code. Oops, a dot to char code. Sorry, I'm having, having a moment. Um, oh, is it, I think it, there we go char code at that's what it is whoops no double ats sorry about that okay so we have the number 97 if we look at the letter a encoded as decimal it's 97 if we want to encode it as hexadecimal which would be base 16 then it gets encoded as 61 if we were to encode all three letters A, B, C as hexadecimal, mm. oh, we'd have to convert it first to the number. Anyway, I'm not going to do that. My point is that a matter of how you the the matter of how you view data is all about the matter of how you encode it. Are you encoding it as character strings? Are you encoding it as decimal numbers? Are you encoding it as hexadecimal, base sixty four, a proprietary format? You have to know how you're encoding data. But the point of that is just that all data can be encoded as numbers. In fact, all data can be encoded as binary, simply meaning that there's a bit either on or off. There's an electrical signal being stored in a piece of solid state memory somewhere, or there isn't. So with the understanding that everything can be encoding encoded as numbers, you can treat anything, whether it's a text file or an image or a video, any piece of data can be treated as a number. 
which means that we can do math on any piece of data. We can do math on the letter A because we can, instead of treating it as an ASCII encoding, we can treat it as a decimal encoding. So in math, there are a couple of unique principles, and we're not going to go into anything deep here. Let's just take a random number. I'm just going to type some numbers on the keyboard here. This is a random number. If I divide this number by, say, 100, we're going to change its representation. If we divide it by a thousand or a million, we're going to change its representation. The number is going to lose digits at some point. If we want to multiply the number, then it's going to gain digits. So the number of numbers is getting bigger or smaller. We're either creating more data or we're getting less data. In the case of dividing, we're not actually getting less data unless we do integer division, which is the same as saying that we round. Or maybe it's actually flooring. I'm not quite sure how to say that. But if we ignore, essentially if we ignore the remainder, but there is a mathematical operation that is always guaranteed to produce the same size no matter what, which is called a modulus, which is the remainder. So let's, let's take a simple example. If I have 5 divided by 2, what's the remainder? The remainder is 1, because 2 goes into 5 evenly twice, and there's 1 left over. And likewise, if I were to say 7 and pick a bigger number like 30, we can ask, what's the remainder of 30 divided by 7? Well, 7 goes evenly into 30, I believe it is 4 times, to result in 28, which means that we would have a remainder of 2. And we can check here, this is the modulus operator. Yes, that is correct. Let's look at our previous one. What was it? 5 mod 2 is 1? Yeah. So this is the modulus operator, and this is kind of the basis of hashing, because it allows us to get a one-way function where no matter how big a number is, we can go on forever and ever and ever. Whoops, let's actually do numbers, not just random characters here. We can go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And when we do a mod, the remainder is always between 0 and the mod. So if I do mod 27, the number can't possibly be bigger than 27. Likewise, if I do 30 or 672 or, you know, we can go on and on and on, but I'm guaranteed to always get a number that is the same size or smaller than the mod. So a very basic hash function would just be to take the remainder of, so say you take a video file, you convert it into a number that basically has a million digits or a billion digits, and then you take the remainder of it when you divide it by some other number. This is, this is essentially how a hash works. Now, in the case of modulus, there's a couple of problems. Sorry, it's late. I didn't actually think I was going to do a stream this late because I did a stream earlier in the morning, but uh, then the mood struck, so I did. Where was I? When you take the modulus of a number, the problem with this is that it's extremely predictable. So if you gave me, say, this result here, let me actually hit enter so it shows up on the screen. If you gave me this result, it would be very easy for me to find a number that will give give a remainder. So if, if, if you say, here's the remainder, there are essentially an infinite number of numbers which could give you that remainder. So it'd be, it wouldn't be very useful cryptographically as a secret because I could find lots of numbers that would match that. So a hash is typically a little more complex. Basically, it starts with a more or less randomish, kind of primish number. And as you 
add numbers into the function, it chunks them out into pieces. It doesn't do the whole number all at once. It handles a little bit of it as a time. So it might read in a few bytes of the movie file and then perform an operation on that. And that will produce a result that is difficult to, it's easy to calculate, but difficult to predict if that makes sense. And then when you feed in the next bytes, it'll use the state of the calculation from the previous calculation and then add those bytes on top of it. So if you ever add bytes in an exact sequence together, you get the same output. And we'll demonstrate this real here, uh, real quick here. So I'm gonna do a SHA-2 sum, do a SHA-256 sum of a file. We'll do good.md and we get this SHA-256 sum. Now, if I go and I modify this file, and I put one character of change all the way at the very end, look at what our hash was before, and now look what our hash is now. Pretty much any of the characters that happen to be in the same order is by complete random chance. None of this stuff is in order because of the change that we made. And this is the value of a hash over simpler mathematical functions, is that any change anywhere in the file will result in a hash that is very difficult to predict. And this allows the, a hash to function as a fingerprint or a signature for a file. If I have the hash, of a file, if I have, so to speak in simple terms, it's modulus, I can be relatively guaranteed that if the file were modified, so let me back up a second. Oh, sorry again for all the audio. I'm going to get back to doing these a little bit earlier and planning them out a little bit better. It's just this week has been hectic. So if if I want to send you a file, or let's even go simpler than this. Let's say you want to catalog all of the pictures on your hard drive or all of the music on your hard drive. If you hash every single file, you can find if there are any exact duplicates. But if there's even a slight change between files, say one picture you've done a little bit of color correction on, the hashes will be completely dissimilar. So just by comparing a very small amount of information, you can tell if two files are the same or not. So if you were gonna create a database out of lots and lots of files or lots and lots of posts, hashes would provide a very good identifier because it is essentially more likely that there will be an extinction level event of the entire earth than that any two hashes either by accident or on purpose will be the same for files that are different. So to be more clear about that, a file can be very long. A file can be kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. But out of all the possible permutations that a human will ever create in a file, it is extremely unlikely that a SHA-256 hash will ever appear at random. And in the case of things like Bitcoin miners, where it's doing Terra hashes and it's using weaker hash algorithms, or not necessarily that they are weak per se, but that they were not designed for literally completely random Ex trying to exhaust what we call the key space. So the key space in a hash is every possible permutation of, this is encoded hexadecimal, so we'll say hexadecimal. It could be encoded in decimal, it'd be longer. If it was base 64, it'd be shorter. But if we took every possible <laughs> permutation of the numbers 0 through 9 and A through F, in any possible order, that is the key space of a SHA-256 hash. It's this long. Again, 
by random chance or by trying to to craft a file that matches a, a different hash on purpose, we are more likely to have an ex a planetary extinction level event than for computers to be able to generate hashes that are similar to one another. So it functions very well as a secure ID for a file. So if we're not just talking about a database, but if we're talking about actually sending transactions back and forth, I send you an email and I want you to know that the email has not been tampered with, I could hash the email and then I could encrypt the message. And if the message decrypts, this means that it decrypts, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the message hasn't been modified. You could take something that's encrypted and you could change it, and it might happen to unencrypt. The results of what it unencrypts to might be unpredictable, but it could decrypt. If an encrypted file were to contain a hash at the end of it, then you would have a very strong guarantee that the data came from the party that supposedly sent it and that the data has not been modified. In fact, your web browser, when you visit your bank website, uses an encryption called AES-256-GCM, which does exactly this. It encrypts every time you hit submit on a form. All of the data is encrypted, and then the data is hashed and encrypted the, the hash is part of the encrypted data. So it's guaranteed not only that you sent the data and the, the bank sent the data back to you, but it's also guaranteed that the data has not been modified as well. So these are two different things. Anyway, I hope that that helped you understand a little bit the principle behind a hash. Basically, think of it as you're asking the question, what's the remainder of this if I turn it into a number and divide it by a special magic number, but in a very, very complicated way. But in essence, it's just asking what's the remainder, and that is enough to identify. Because if we had a large enough number Let's just keep going, 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 keep going. And we had a large enough modulus. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That's about the size of a SHA-256 or so, maybe a few more. Then whenever we took the remainder, we would get something that's relatively unique. All right. Well, with that, I'm out for the night. Adios. Oh, and uh, if you do want to see more content like this, and again, I apologize this week's been crazy hectic and I've fallen asleep at the wheel over here and I haven't put as much preparation into these as I would have liked to and I have in the previous week, but we'll get back to that. So if you'd like to subscribe to the live streams, that is in the description, the Cool Age 86 channel. That's me personally. And if you'd like to subscribe to the edited versions and some of the Beyond Code exclusive content, that is the Beyond Code subscription, which is what I'm trying to transition this channel over to, but all the subscribers and monetization and everything is over here, so I gotta build that up first. And uh, yeah, go ahead. if this helped you, give it a like. If you've got some questions or comments, uh, constructive criticism, go ahead and leave that in the comments. And as always, if you've got some topic that you'd like me to prattle on about for a bit, I'd be happy to do that for you. Just let me know in the comments. All right.